out there in podcast land and internet land and welcome back to the front row network here on npr illinois your entertainment hub um i'm jeremy geckner and i am bringing you an amazing interview today i got so lucky to be able to talk to the director of the new horror action comedy coming out renfield uh this film is starring nicholas cage and nicholas holt and aquafina among many others um and it chronicles uh, the tale of renfield uh the henchman of dracula uh as he uh deals with some kind of codependency issues with uh, with Dracula, his boss in modern day New Orleans. Um, Chris McKay is the director of this film and he was so gracious with his time to come here and talk about making not only this film but also his uh, journey into filmmaking um, as we love to do on the Front Row Network as you know. Um, but this is so great. We get to dive into not only like his influences when he was growing up. Uh, he's an actual an Illinois local person. Grew up uh, in Chicago. Went to school down at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Um, you know, we got to talk about his influences and how his love of Alfred Hitchcock for all you classic films uh, buffs up there but then we really dive into the making of the film Renfield working with Nicolas Cage and Nicholas Holt uh, the kind of pressure of furthering the Dracula story as it were um, and just kind of you know balancing comedy and action filmmaking uh, he's got an amazing mind on him really really fun interview I can't wait for you to hear it and I'm going to stop talking so you can so without further ado here is uh, my interview with the director of the new horror action comedy coming out April 14th Renfield director Chris McKay let me explain. My boss gave me this power. In return, I tend to his needs, including care, feeding. You bring in people to eat? You're like the guy that gets the villain's postmates. But if you were to stop focusing on his needs, what would happen? He won't grow to full power. Exactly. He won't grow to full power. What? That's so weird. Why would you phrase it like that? But yes. Hi, are you here for the meeting? Well, come on! No! Oh, no! Some call me the Dark One. Others, the Lord of Death. To most, I am the Lark. Chris McKay, I want to thank you so much for joining us here on the uh, Front Row Network on NPR Illinois to talk about Renfield. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Jeremy. I really, really appreciate talking to you. So first things first, I've got to ask you about uh, what we always ask people about here when they come on the Front Row Network. We're going to talk about the film here very soon. Um, but before that, I just want to ask you about uh, what your superhero origin story is. We always ask it this way. Um, you know, you went from being born human being to big time film director. Uh, just how does that happen? How did you get from one place to the other there? I got to see all these movies really young. And um, I got to see like both the Bela Lugosi Dracula and the Christopher Lee uh, Hammer Horror of Dracula, and those made a big impression. In fact, the sort of the the beginning of our movie is kind of something like the end of uh, Horror of Dracula, where Dracula gets you know burned by by sunlight, and uh, Renfield has to take care of him, and that's kind of that kind of starts our movie. So so those things have uh, those things are uh, you know a really deep in influence on me. But but yeah, I I. Just always knew I wanted to make movies. I made little movies when I was a kid, and then I, you know, went to college and went to Southern Illinois for uh, two years, and then went to Columbia College uh, and studied film and got to work on, uh, you know, local film productions and things like that. So yeah, I was really fortunate that I was just kind of like got to kind of see all this stuff, and had parents to sort of let me uh, let let me explore these these things. They were they they got me a subscription to Fangoria magazine yes. when I was a kid, and that was like that was like my that was like my birthday or my, my Christmas present every year was a subscription to Fangoria magazine. That's so awesome. <laughs> I've, I've definitely read me a Fangoria every once in a while. Um, but what I love about that is all your Illinois connections. Cause obviously we're NPR Illinois, but um, you know, you talk about Libertyville. I actually went uh, to high school in Mount Vernon, Illinois. So I definitely know SIU. Uh, oh yeah. Go, go Salukis, uh, yeah. of course. <laughs> um, and uh, of course you're right. Going up to uh, Columbia there. Um, and I'm going to make the, the uh, painful mistake of all journalists here, which I'm going to ask you a question about something i read on the internet because it never goes wrong um but okay. i learned that um was it true that your first uh like kind of attendance on a film set was actually uncle buck up in chicago yeah i, I worked uh i was the i was a pa on uncle buck and got to you know kind of work in the office of the producers and got to do a bunch of different odd jobs and stuff like that and um you know got to meet uh, john hughes and john candy and kind of watch them work yeah. and um and even and even before that uh i when i was uh i guess a couple of years before that when i was younger i went to uh 
watch them shoot Ferris Bueller's Day Off, the uh, parade scene yeah. in Ferris Bueller's with Winston Shout and Don Shane parade scene, and I got to watch them do that, and uh, and so that was that was my you know I was just a, a, a you know they they basically put an ad in the newspaper like you know come down and watch a movie get shot, and I uh, <laughs> I was a huge uh, Breakfast Club fan and stuff like that, and so it was John Hughes, and I I wanted to see how they made a movie, so I got to go down there and and uh watch them uh shoot that scene and try to figure out how that was going to fit in the movie and uh <laughs> and then and then we yeah, are watching them work watching john hughes work um that was a really uh big experience for me a because i did really love his movies and loved john candy who was a really amazing really nice funny obviously funny but just yeah, as a human being funny mm. kind person um it was that was really uh that was really nice to see and like lou lombardo did the editing and lou lombardo had done you know the wild bunch and things like that so there's like all this film history that i was absorbing and excited about and uh so yeah so i was really lucky really lucky to get to to kind of witness that and all the different departments so like that was cool yeah and there's what a time for you to grow up with the love of film when john hughes is just making every movie in chicago in the chicago area <laughs> I mean, you know it's just you turn yeah. around there's a new movie john hughes yeah. is filming <laughs> yeah. yeah it was it was that was really great and and the fact that you'd go see these movies and they would be set in chicago and you would see you know houses and neighborhoods that look like your neighborhood and stuff like that i mean that's you know uh that was something really special and it made it just i think it just made it so that it, you know for me you know whether it was you know there was a john hughes movie or my bodyguard or the blues brothers or whatever when i saw stuff that was uh from chicago shot in places that i knew it just made it more accessible for me to mm -hmm. say that's a that's something I could do with my life. It did. It did what? It wasn't Hollywood. It wasn't New York. It wasn't something that wasn't immediate to me. It actually said, "Oh yeah, you can make movies here." And then when I saw John Carpenter's Halloween, and even though they didn't shoot it in Illinois, it was Haddonfield, Illinois, mm -hmm. and it was you know it was like it was like it just, some of that stuff just made it much more uh, real for me. Yeah, that's exactly kind of how my love of movies like Foster too. I saw things that looked, you know, real like that. I was super into all the John Hughes stuff. And, you know, when I went to Chicago, I was like, ah, there that is, there that is, and stuff like that. And you're right. It just kind of like made it real <laughs> for me as well. Um, you know, yeah. and uh, we have a actually on our network here, a classic film podcast. So I would be remiss if I didn't get you to talk about, um, I'm told that Hitchcock was one of your big influences growing up that you really admired as a director. Um, were there any kind of like yeah. of his films that you really gravitated towards or any of his like kind of stylistic tendencies that you try to emulate yeah well you know uh, my mom was the first person that mentioned alfred hitchcock to me and i can't even remember in what context but it's just something that had made an impression on her when she was a kid seeing seeing his movies or whatever mm. so i because that was something that was important to her and then i heard other filmmakers i read stuff about steven spielberg and he would talk about hitchcock or scorsese and so, so I wanted to see this stuff, and there was no real way for me to see any of this, any of these things at the time, because, like I said, we didn't have a VCR, we didn't have cable. So, you know, I, and and even then, I don't even know if they were even on VHS right away. I remember when they finally did come on VHS, it was a big deal, and it wasn't something that they played like in heavy rotation on any sort of, um, any any kind of uh, you know late night TV, you know. Uh, uh, but I had a English teacher who at Libertyville high school, who also had a film class or sort of an offshoot of our English class. And she played movies occasionally. And the, one of the first movies that she played was notorious, mm. which, you know, it's Cary Grant, Ingrid Bergman, it's 1946 Alfred Hitchcock movie. And, uh, famous for this very long extended kissing scene uh -huh. and, and <laughs> lots of really interesting camera work. Uh, that he did to reveal that she had got a key that she needed to get down into the uh, mm. <laughs> wine cellar and all that stuff. And a great ending, like a really, really just like it ends at the perfect uh, time. And so seeing that movie at that age, after being hungry to see what an Alfred Hitchcock movie was, uh, you know, reading about Psycho and the shower scene and the birds and this mm. and that. I was blown away. Like I was blown away by the, you know, the compactness of the storytelling. And, you know, it was really, 
I didn't, you know, maybe I didn't track every single thing that was happening in the movie and underneath with Cary Grant and, uh, you know, what he was going through, but it something about it spoke to me. And I just, I fell in love with, uh, uh, you know, his, his work. And as soon as, it, as soon as any of that stuff was available in VHS or, you know, ultimately Blu-ray and stuff like that, like I just, I ate it up. I bought every, everything I get my hands on. And, um, and, you know, uh, you know, try to study all of his, all of his work. And I was just, I was just fortunate that, you know, this, again, it's just the, you know, happy accident. This teacher had this class or something that was on my list of things that I <laughs> wanted to, wanted to watch. And then when you talk about like influence and stuff like that, there's actually two shots, uh, in the, in the movie that are, uh, right out of notorious. There's a shot of, uh, uh Aquafina waking up and she's in Renfield's apartment and she sees Renfield and it does the kind of Hitchcock, you know, Ingrid Bergman's waking up from a from a hangover and Cary Grant's standing over her and it you know the camera does this twisty thing with yes. you know where where, where Cary Grant is upside down in the in the frame and because she's uh, she you know in, in our movie nor and Aqu- Aquafina's Kind of upside down and looking, you know, out of Renfield. So we do a similar thing. It's just stuff like that. That you know, besides the fact that he's just, um, you know, just a master at, at suspense, obviously framing, mm. um, complicated characters, really complicated uh, characters. Uh, sometimes, you know, uh, you know, had had a for its time had had a sexiness to yeah. some of it. You know, when you look at To Catch a Thief and that sort of thing. Um, he was able to sort of make movies that still, to for me anyway, to this day play, you know, really well. Like his, his, you know, Vertigo, Rear Window, uh, Shadow of a Doubt, Strange on a Train, mm-hmm. you know, Psycho the Birds, like all that stuff, like Frenzy, all that stuff. I still think plays, you know, really great. Notorious is one of my all time favorite movies, and even stuff that's like kind of like you know, uh, you know, uh, saboteur or. Um, I know Hitchcock doesn't necessarily regard like Rebecca as a Hitchcock movie, but I find right. the movie really compelling. Yeah, no, I, um, I, I so totally anyway. do. Yeah. <laughs> and there was the one that got me like, um, that kind of like arrested me when I watched it was rope. That one was like the one where I just all of a sudden was like, man, I'm watching something really cool here. <laughs> like it just the long yeah. shots and like, it's basically five big long shots, the whole thing. I was like, this is a play that they, they put a camera on stage with. <laughs> But he figured out, you know, like he used he, and he cuts in camera a lot. He uses the camera to cut, you know, use the camera to go from a wide to a to a medium to a close. It starts so perversely, too, with the yeah. guy's strangling guy. It's so it's so not like when you think about even if you look at a film noir movie, you know, like the you know, pick your most brutal film noir movie. It's it doesn't it doesn't. And I love I'm, I'm a huge, you know, like, you know, out of the past and things like that like the you know, movies like that are you know, made it made a big impression on me but like there's just with the hitch guy he starts with those guys strangling their their fellow student and it's just like and it just starts with that shot yeah. and it's just you know not nobody was doing stuff like that and that would still be if you started a movie like that today that would still be you know shocking where it's just the the two main characters literally like strangle you know finishing strangling a guy to death right there and then putting him in a in a you know, you know, uh, uh, yeah, in the trunk, sort of, you yeah, know, uh, armoire, like in the yeah. trunk, and yeah, it was, it was just, you know, that's that stuff just works so good, and it's just, and it, and like you said, it's based on a play, but he still found ways of finding ways of making it cinematic, and that set's so cool. Oh yeah, like yeah, it's broken great. Oh, everything about that, and then like when you're watching it, it's just all of a sudden you kind of forget that he's even in there sometimes too, because all the other action in the in the apartment is compelling. And then every time they're near it, I'm just like, oh right, he's in there, <laughs> like, you know? Uh, yeah. He's just such uh, yeah. a master. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I yeah, feel so- like I've gotten a, a good amount for you for our classic podcast. There, I'm doing double duty here. Let's uh, let's talk about Renfield a little bit. How about <laughs> we do that? Because this this film looks like so much damn fun here. Um, but you you told me a little bit earlier. But like, so when was like the first time you encountered like Dracula in the, in those characters? Like what medium was it? Was it the book or was it the film that you mentioned there? Well, it was probably the first thing I actually encountered Dracula as I read uh, the first book I checked out from the library that I prob- that I read on my own cover to cover. And I think I read it like in an afternoon was this book called Movie Monsters by Alan Ormsby. And it was um the first half of the book was was uh, basically biographies of 
of each of these monsters, you know, mm. all the universal monsters and even like things like black yellow and stuff like that. <laughs> but it did, it, it told you all about who these monsters were and, and uh, you know, kind of their history and the films that they were in and stuff like that. And the second half of the book is, was uh, makeup tutorials on how to do, how to, how to be Dracula or the werewolf for Halloween and huh. went into all these details about, you know, how to create, you know, gl- you know, gloves that felt like the mummy's hands and stuff like that that you could wear and, and you know, how to do all this stuff. And so for me, that was like, it was a great combination of like, oh, here's all these things I'm really interested in, you know, horror movies and monsters and weird stuff. And and then the back of it is like, and Halloween is like my favorite holiday. So it's like, yes. here's all these things about how to practically make like, you know, uh, uh, Halloween outfits and the level of detail, because Alan Ormsby is actually a screenwriter um, who wrote a lot of Bob Clark uh, horror movies and he wrote uh, the Paul Schrader cat people. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he, the detail in like under, you know, like that was probably like my first experience like as a filmmaker understanding like the level of detail that the film, you know, like really understand, you know, it's like that kind of thing. Sometimes you have these moments that are like these breakthroughs, about ah, it's, you know, it's not just this collection of, you know, of these things that happen in front of the camera. There's all these moving parts mm-hmm. that somebody has to do and make these choices and stuff like that. Dracula's widow's peak and the, you know, the pale makeup or the sand in the fingernails of the mummy and, that sort of thing, like all that stuff, you know, that's the thing as a, you know, as a kid was just eye opening, like, oh, people do this, people make this stuff. And this level of detail in order to make something that looks like this, you have to have, you have to have that level of detail uh, and want to achieve something, you have a vision for something. So, so yeah, so it was eye opening for me in a, in a lot of ways, but it, was, it made, it made a huge impression on me. So that's, so that's the way I first experienced all of these characters. And then seeing the 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 you know the universal monsters in the movie of the week mm. stuff like that that was the that was where i got to see that in the hammer week and stuff like that yeah so and it's, it's all that stuff and, it must be so amazing now because you get to add to that legend you literally get to add to the legend of dracula <laughs> in this new chapter i mean what what does that do to your brain man you're literally furthering the story of dracula yeah, I, you know, I don't know. I I don't know if I've. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's probably important for me anyway to not think about that at all because uh, you know because those movies are really you know even look. I mean, I even like like the Frank Langella, uh, yeah, you know, nineteen seventies disco Dracula. Like there's movies like that that were just like you know kind of like uh, and I and I loved Blackula. Like when I saw Blackula, I think on like Son of Sven Gulli or something like that. Um, I, uh, I remember watching that movie and like being blown away. So, and even in, in this, you know, this is the same thing, you know, on, on when I was making Lego Batman where, you know, I think it was easier to sort of disconnect cause it was, you know, made with Lego and it was animated. So mm-hmm. you kind of disconnect a little bit from like, you know, the history of, of Batman. Uh, but when I see lists of people's favorite Batman movies and Lego Batman is up there and Way that, up high. There's, you know, <laughs> when it's up there with mask mask of the phantasm and, and, you know, you know, the dark Knight and things like that. I really, there's obviously a sense of pride and, uh, and that was, you know, that was a really special, um, movie and working on the Lego movies and all the Lego movies is a really special experience. So, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, I feel really lucky, but like, I just tried, you know, when I was when we were making this, you know, Cage was a big Christopher Lee fan, yes, and yes. he, uh, you know, he really, um, uh, he really wanted to honor the history of Dracula, and I, and for me, part of it, part of it was just synthesizing, uh, uh, like all the Dracula stuff that I liked, you know, taking a little bit from here, taking a little bit there, you know, take a little bit of Bela Lugosi's costume, take a little bit from the Gary Oldman thing, take a little bit from you know, uh, vampire images that I liked, like the Lon Chaney Sr., London After Midnight, Sharp, uh, yeah. all of, you know, having all of the teeth be sharp, taking things from this, the Stoker novel, obviously, and finding ways. Uh, and, and in the movie, we we comp Cage and Holt into uh, in, into the Bela Lugosi, Todd Browning, 1931 no way. movie as a, as a flashback. So, it's, so you get to see cage in costume on the stairs with a cobweb giant cobweb behind him and or a spider web behind him and stuff like that like so there was lots of uh lots of opportunities to homage all of the things that i love 
and um, and kind of draw inspiration from them. So I maybe maybe because I was synthesizing it, I didn't really necessarily like you know feel like that you know and any you know, I mean, obviously you feel pressure whenever you're making a movie. There's enough pressure to go around you're right. when you're making a movie. So <laughs> maybe maybe just the general pressure that I felt to make something that was good and, and worthy and that sort of thing. So, yeah. Well, it, it definitely looks from the trailers, at least like you succeeded here. Uh, you already mentioned there though, uh, your pair of Nicks that are the center of your film here, uh, Nick Cage and Nick Holt. Um, I have to ask the ridiculous question. You called them different names, right? On set, because that would be very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, I think it was sort of Mr. Cage and Mr. Holt. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. Probably, <laughs> probably a lot of that. Uh, or Dracula, call him Dracula and Renfield. You know, I'm gonna have Dracula come over here, Renfield. You're gonna stay right there. You know, it's probably a lot of that. But you know, but y- because you know, you get to sort of know people, and yeah, it's it's it was tough to say, tough sometimes not to say Nick and Nick, and uh, yeah. But yeah, yeah, you've got to be a little more. Curious. Yeah, well, I mean, question, way, I'm sure they would just like, you know, but that would be funny if they just both responded, both went to the same spot. Um, but no, talk to me a, a little bit about working with these, because obviously Nicholas Holt has been ascending pretty much ever since he first got on the on the on the mainstream here. Um, you know, obviously with the grade, he's getting all these nominations. But Nick Cage now on this huge like comeback uh, tour. I don't even know if I want to call it that. He never went anywhere. He was just, you know, he's still Nick Cage. But like wor- working with these two guys in, in so close proximity, what was it like just having? both of them on the set in this particular story yeah um you know i've been a nick cage fan since i was a kid like i just think that guy is amazing Mm. um you know uh at you know everything like you know whether it's the you know vampire's kiss and raising arizona and (laughs) stuff like that and birdie was a i remember you know seeing birdie really young and being really uh, impressed with with uh, obviously love that movie and then impressed with him, um, but you know even stuff like it could happen to you and, and honeymoon in Vegas and things like that. Like it was just you know I was just always a huge fan. I thought he always did interesting stuff. Moonstruck, mm-hmm. like he was just so watchable, yeah, so charismatic. Um, he's got he's got chemistry. You know, he's got a lot of chemistry with the actors, but he's got chemistry with the camera. Mm. Like he's just he's he's a movie star and. Yeah, I never look at it like he went away. I always thought he was always making really interesting choices. Like yeah. he's just a guy who wants to try, he's a guy who wants to try things and do things. And my experience with him, you know, you never know what you're going to, you know, to you never know what uh you know, I, I you know, I'm like you. Like I, you know, I, I don't know what, you know, who's going to show what what kind of person is going to show up <laughs> on set when you hire somebody. You see, sort of taking a leap of faith, you know. And I you know, he's so good and so game to play and to try things and has great ideas and wants to fuck around and, Mm. you know, do like, just like make, uh, you know, just, just make interesting choices. Like, and, and he's, you know, he's like, you know, I can't say enough good things about him because he's just like, he's a really great and really vulnerable. Like he's vulnerable as a, as a performer. Um, he's vulnerable as a human being. Like I just really, uh, I just really was really impressed with him and loved working with him and Nick Holt, somebody uh, I was, I talked to in a meeting a while back on a different project and I just really liked him and we kind of kept in touch. And then the minute that I read this script, I was like, there's no other person that can play Renfield. You know, like he's just, he's just a, he's so versatile. He's unafraid to be weird. Mm. And, you know, you need somebody who can, he's unafraid to be eat bugs. You need somebody <laughs> who can do comedy. You need somebody who can do action incredibly. You need somebody who can be charming, you know, in, in, incredibly charming and and charismatic. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, you know, uh, to be able to hide that he's attractive, but then also kind of like <laughs> be, you know, a movie, movie star, leading man. Um, like he's just, you know, and he got it, he threw himself into the stunts. He threw himself into the, uh, we had, at one point we had a dance sequence, uh, that got oh, cut, yes. but he's like, he threw, we threw himself into the choreography of the dance sequence. Like he's great. And he's like, he's just got a guy who can do it all. And he's like the real deal. Mm. And, um, yeah, I couldn't have done this movie without him. Like, there'd literally be no way to, you know, I don't know, you know, with cage, there's only like a handful of people that you really want to like, that you want to line up and see play Dracula, you know, like yeah. there's like, there's just like a couple of people and he's top of that list. Yes. And with Renfield movie star that you needed somebody who's a movie star that can, that, but, ha- but can do all of this range. And, uh, and somebody who 
who cares like that? Like I just, you know, I, I, yeah, I got really lucky. I got really lucky that both these guys were available, said yes, got the movie, <laughs> wanted it. Really no, lucky. you are absolutely correct. Cause like when I first like read like that, this movie was coming out, I was like, you know, I'm such a big, I'm a horror buff and you know, like I'm a film, like a student of classic film and stuff. And so I was like, man, that sounds really cool. I would like something from that perspective. And then I saw Nick Cage's Dracula and I was like, yep, money, uh, just take the money. <laughs> just take all my money. <laughs> um, I need to see this yeah. happen right now. Um, but you did mention there about the uh, comedy and action aspects of this film. And uh, you know, just from the trailers, it definitely looks like that is, like a perfect blend this film is of the comedy and the action genres there um you know would it be fair to say that and how do you keep those kind of things balanced in a movie like this like not tilting too much one way or the other yeah i mean it's tricky because obviously there's like you know there's only a handful of like um particularly horror uh comedies horror action comedies mm -hmm. that work um you know uh Shaun of the dead mm -hmm. uh american werewolf in london uh, you know, uh, maybe <laughs> Fright Night or any Fright Night probably isn't even qualified necessarily as a comedy. Like Evil Dead Two, yep. maybe like it's like there's this there's, there's there's very few uh, movies. Young Frankenstein, but uh, uh, but it doesn't have a lot of action. Mm -hmm. it's just made as a straight comedy. <laughs> yeah, like uh, yeah, it's tough. Uh, I mean, what you know, how I approach. Look, I I knew that everything had to have something. You know, whether w w if there's an action scene, it can't just be it can't just be John Wick. It mm -hmm. can't just be like a straight up action scene. There had to be moments of levity. There had to be moments of splat stick humor, sort of a la Evil Dead Two. Yeah. Um. So there. So uh. So we talked a lot with with Chris Brewster, the stunt coordinator and second unit director. Talked a lot about Jackie Chan yeah. choreography. Finding, you know, he uses a he uses a post its to to you know to you know <laughs> cut a guy's you know you know arm off or something like there's you know finding way finding using the room uh finding humor finding moments of character uh in the fight scene that was stuff that we talked a lot about so so that they wouldn't just be okay now here's the action scene okay here now here's the you know uh here's the stunts or whatever there had to be something that was always kind of funny or over the top right you know it had to kind of be over the top like gross out or um, you know ridiculous uh that those things so that was that was a lot of what we did and then i looked at the color palette you know because it's you know the in order to balance horror and comedy and action um the movie couldn't necessarily be shot like a typical uh horror film mm -hmm. i had to find a way to make the horror still work and suspense still work as you know where there is that kind of thing and the comedy so i used uh basil gogos as an inspiration who's the guy that did all the famous monsters covers yeah. of the famous monsters magazine so he was the guy who reinterpreted the uh, at, at that time this was like the 60s or something at that time the horror icons of uh, bella gosi frankenstein all that stuff had only been seen in black and white yeah there had been no color they just shoot it as a color so he was the first person to kind of put them in color. He's the first, he's the first person who, so he did these really garish, uh, saturated tones and that was a way. So when I sort of, I used that style to, and adapted it to the movie as a way to say, okay, look, it's not, it's not straight up horror. It's not straight up comedy, but they, those, those two things can coexist. And so that was one way that we tried to make that, make, make, make that work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, again, that's another thing that really jumped out to me from the clips and the trailers is like that color palette is, you know, like very striking and very stark. And especially in the yeah. poster as well, like, you know, just the, the image of Nick Cage over him right there. But the colors are just like so like vivid right there, yet somehow, you know, still horrific. Uh, you know, like it's I, I just I, I cannot wait for this film. Chris, why you got to do this to me? <laughs> why you got to make things I want to see? Um, well, you know, I, before I uh, wrap up here, though, like I did there's a final question we always like to ask people because look you you're a film director you've done so many interviews like this you get to do so many interviews with with journalists and everything like that and so what we always like to ask is just kind of like is there a question or a story or anything that you wish you could have talked about in some kind of an interview but that no one just ever asked you that like nobody ever just kind of like brought it up and everything is there something that like sticks out you maybe with filming Renfield that you haven't been asked but you would really love to tell about 
Yeah, I mean, for me, I, you know, I, I got to work with, besides the really great actors, you know, Cage and Holt, we've talked about, Aquafina, uh, Ben Schwartz, Shore, amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Shore is, is incredible. Um, uh, Brandon Scott Jones, Adrian Martinez, got to work with a lot of really great actors. I also got to work with a really great crew. Yes. And uh, so I got to work with Alec Hammond as the production designer, who's an incredible, an incredible eye, uh, really got the tone of this movie, you know, really understood what we needed to do, created some beautiful sets. Um, uh, I got to work with Lisa Lavas as the costume designer. And she she did, you know, horror movies, they're all about production design, they're all about costuming. Uh, especially when you're talking about Dracula and that sort of thing. And, and Dracula has a toxic narcissist, which is what this movie sort of posits that he is a gaslighting narcissist to Renfield, um, uh, which is why Renfield is going to codependent anonymous meetings. Yes. Um, uh, so he, uh, her, her costumes were amazing and uh, really loved working with her. Gary tours and Mike Panovic, who are the prop guys. And they, you know, I worked with them on Tomorrow War. They're great with guns. Like yeah. they really, as far as safety goes, and as far as understanding, you know, weaponry and that sort of thing, as well as, you know, they came up with like just like just cool like vampire hunter kits and all sorts of stuff and bugs that we could eat and things <laughs> like that for for Holt and Jamie Price, the VFX supervisor, because I, I did a little bit of practical effects with Christian Tinsley, who was amazing. Christian and his team, they did Westworld. Um, some really brutal stuff in the Westworld TV series. Mm. Really great. And um, uh, uh, so Christian Tinsley and Jamie Price working together. We did a lot of blood effects. We got a guy getting his arms ripped off and getting beat up with his own arms. <laughs> We've got like all sorts of all sorts of uh, all, all sorts of crazy things that we do in the movie. Um, that that the, the, those guys working with those guys, that was a lot of fun. And that's the thing. I just feel like those people need a shout out because um you know, because directors, writers, you know, the the main cast, big movie stars, they get a lot of credit. But it's these people who, you know, it's 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 Alec and his team, Lisa and her team, uh, Jamie and Christian and his team, Chris Brewster, the stunt coordinator. You know, again, it's these in the stunt guys, uh, amazing, amazing group of stunt guys. Mm. These are the people that are working, you know, overtime to get this movie off the ground and get it going. My storyboard team, yeah. all that stuff. Dave Cole, who did the color correction, who made all the colors, you know, at Photochem, who made all the colors, you know, come out. Like those are the people, you know, that's the people I like to champion because they're just, they really are. They they make the movie. It's this. They make it's the difference. And when you don't, and when you have, you know, one bad crew member, it really can affect everything. And so having. So it's fortunate to have so many good people uh, on this movie and their and, and also their departments. That's the thing is great leaders have great departments mm-hmm. uh, and and great people to work under them. And I, you know, to to a to a man or a woman, I had, um, you know, with with those with those teams, I had amazing people and they. They deserve all the all the all the praise. They really do. Absolutely. Well, you know, I've I worked as a DIT and an assembly editor on some very uh, oh. very small indie films uh, that were here in the Midwest. Um, so I can tell you right now, I know every single one of them is appreciating you quite a bit right now for calling out the work that they do. Um, so just wonderful. Yeah, the dit is a really important part of making movies these days. Tell you what, I was not uh, ready for that job, man. <laughs> they they told me what it was, and <laughs> then I went in on it. And I was just like, ah, so I'm not sleeping for two weeks now i got it um so <laughs> but it was great yeah. um yeah. well chris thank you so much for your time today uh renfield it opens april 14th only in theaters everywhere people get your butts out to the theater and see this movie it's gonna be so awesome april 14th um once again chris just thank you so much for your time today and uh for giving us uh, some amazing art in this world uh, we we all really appreciate it thanks jeremy i really really appreciate talking to you thank you very much There you are, everyone. I hope you enjoyed my interview there with Renfield director Chris McKay. Again, this film is coming out April 14th. It's only in theaters. You're not going to be able to find it on VOD. So make sure you take the time. Go to the movie theater. Get that ticket and see this. Again, it's Nicolas Cage's Dracula. What more do you need? I don't need to sell you on this. Um, but, of course, if you want to find any more interviews from the Fro Network, you know where to find us. NPRIllinois.org slash program slash front dash row dash network. And, of course, find us over all the socials wherever you find the Front Row Network. Search for them or on Twitter at Front Row Reviews with 
with a Z. Uh, thank you guys once again for listening and for watching wherever you are. We always appreciate you, our listeners. And as always, we'll see you in the front row. Thank you.